while we're working on the system, it sounds like you can hear me now. Wonderful, wonderful. God bless our PA people. We want to invite everybody to come on and move down to, to the lower area of this wonderful synagogue. I'm Harriet. I've been a member of this congregation since before this building was here, when this was a warehouse. And it is an absolute pleasure to be invited to welcome you all into my spiritual home, because the work that we are doing is spiritual work. It's the deepest spiritual work to be able to move beyond our fears to get involved, our fears that we don't matter, and to actually step into activism, especially if you're an introvert by nature. And, and, and to do this work and to keep doing this work requires that we have a strong spiritual foundation. Whatever tradition speaks to you, but to stay grounded in something that is eternal, and that is love. In our Jewish tradition, we have the Old Testament, and this time of the year, we are reviewing all of, all of the plagues. And we know that the fossil fuel reality is a reality of plagues. And everybody that's here today is trying to help prevent one more plague from what Rabbi Arthur Waskow calls the fossil fuel pharaohs. And so I want to thank us all for the work. And I would like to let people know where the bathrooms are if you haven't already discovered them. They're up this little ramp and to the left in the hallway. Well, not in the hallway. Um, <laughs> So that's where the restrooms are. If you have any other questions, you can find me. I'll be sitting over here. And right now, what I'd like to do is introduce the moderator. But actually, before I do that, I want to thank, I'm not going to name all the organizations that have been putting this forum on, and all the speakers who have participated in this panel in the three forums that preceded this, and there'll be another forum next month at the Public Interest Environmental Law Conference in Eugene. So I just want to give a shout out. You can look at the flyers and see the list of all the organizations that have come together to host these presentations so that our community can come together with the united voice and really help guide our city to do what's necessary to transform the hub. I just want everybody who's part of those organizations or who have spoken to please stand up. I know you guys don't like that, but just let everybody give a, give a round of applause. For tonight's panel, we have moderator Michael Pouncil, and he chairs the Portland Harbor Community Advisory Group. It's a group that builds strong working relationships with diverse stakeholders concerning the Portland Harbor Superfund. He and his spouse of 16 years live in Portland, North North Portland's University Park, which is bordered by the Lower Willamette River. So this work is, is really important. It's on his heart. It's on his shoulders. It's in his head. He <laughs> dreams it at night. He's an environmental consultant, a kayaker, forest bather, paddle boarder, wandering biker, and river warrior who is a firm believer that it's a beautiful thing to be on fire for justice. So we welcome Michael. 
and all the panelists to turn your microphones on. You push the button on the bottom until the light turns green. And then you have to talk real close to the microphone. All right. uh, thank you, Harriet. Thank you so much. Welcome, everyone. Um, I think she already in, uh, told folks about the bathrooms or right over there. Um, and uh, later on tonight, also, you know, uh, take some time to, you know, visit the tables back there. We have some some really great groups up there that uh, should be recognized. Um, and um, also, I wanted to um, um, make sure that neighborhood associations, if anyone is part of a neighborhood association or leading one to sign in, um, sign in so that um, um, we can uh, be able to possibly schedule more of these in the future. Um, and also, thanks. Um, these are all the groups here uh, who have helped put this on. So I wanna give those folks all a, another round of applause for um, being here and putting this on tonight. Start this there. Um, so I'm going to um, do a, um, a land acknowledgement. Um, this is sort of a hybrid acknowledgement that I kind of uh, uh, got from my friend. Oh, sort of a land acknowledgement. Do an, a land acknowledgement that I got from my friend uh, uh, Sarah Taylor back there. It's a bit of a hybrid, but I wanted to give her some some credit in letting me uh, play with this here. Um, so, uh, we gather here tonight with the collective term determination to heal, repair, and restore the Lower Willamette River watershed. Its waters, land, natural resources, and wildlife, an act of commitment and stewardship for future generations. Tonight, we acknowledge the villages of the Chinook that once stood on Sabi's Island, the Willamette Channel, St. John's, and the Columbia Slough. We acknowledge their relationship with the many lakes, streams, wetlands, and plants, and plant communities on both sides of the river. We acknowledge the first foods of this region, the vast resources that fed and cared for the people for thousands of years. We acknowledge the many tribes that travel the Willamette River to fish, gather, and trade. We acknowledge the treaties that assure them the right to these first foods as we acknowledge our government's collective and ongoing failure to honor these treaties. With compassion and understanding, we acknowledge and introduce, we acknowledge the introduced diseases that caused untold suffering and death on the shores of this river. We acknowledge the unimaginable grief of mothers and fathers as we too grieve in the midst of our recent pandemic. Uh, tonight, we acknowledge the disproportionate toll that this pandemic has placed on us. Um, indigenous communities in our state and, na and nation, we acknowledge with with the indigenous communities and state and our nations, we acknowledge the systemic racism that leads to disproportionate health and economic and educational impacts for generations to come. We acknowledge our power to dismantle systemic racism and environmental injustice, no matter how difficult it seems, no matter how often we falter. We acknowledge with awe and gratitude this watershed, natural ability to cool the earth, replenish the soils, manage food, prevent wildfires, and provide natural resources for all living things. We have witnessed the earth's ability to heal and repair itself and look forward with joy to this unfolding process in the lower Willamette. With this, we open our eyes and hearts and commit to listen and learn from this place, the confluence of two great rivers, the place we call home, knowing that our decisions, our words, and our actions will impact our rivers, other communities, our planet. Thank you. So um, tonight's guest we have here tonight, the panelists, we have uh, uh, Bob Salinger, who is a conservation director from 
Audubon, there's Bob here. Um, we have uh, um, Melanie Plout, uh, Oregon Physician for Social Responsibility. Uh, Jay Wilson, uh, Clackamas County Resilience Coordinator with the Department of Disaster Management and spearheads the county's efforts to reduce risk and assess hazards. And he's also past chair of the Oregon Systemic, oh, no, sorry, sorry, Oregon Seismic Safety uh, Policy Advisory Commission and former uh, Resilience Fellow, National Institute for Standards and Technology. We also have Barbara Bernstein, uh, host of KWU's Radio's Locus Focus um, and documentarian. And we have Josie Moberg, uh, Climate Justice Fellow at Branch Collective. All right, so with that. That was my question. Where is the person who is changing the slides? She is in hiding, but if you say slide forward, I think she's moving yeah. okay. 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 All right. Okay. All right. All right. So next up, thank you. Thank you. So next. Behind the curtain. So our Bob Salinger is going to start us off tonight, and um, you know, I had some questions for you, Bob. Um, one second here. Um, be patient with me. Sorry about this, guys. Oh, just have them just go for it? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> go for it. It's all yours, Bob. <laughs> you hear me? Yes. All right, I am going to stand up to talk. So good evening. Thanks for coming out tonight. As Michael said, I'm Bob Salinger. I'm the Conservation Director for Portland Audubon Society at least for another 10 days. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. I, I've spoken here on a lot of occasions, and it's almost always been about the same issue. It's about how do we uh, take care of our environment, and particularly how do we take care of our river? How do we deal with this uh, fossil fuel curse that is upon us? Uh, and how do we push back on it? I think the last time I was here, my son was actually speaking with a variety of high school students, Native American youth that had come up here really powerful to see that generation uh, fighting this. And, and, and I give them a lot of credit because uh, at least my generation, and I think a lot of the people in this room weren't that active. We were kind of between the activist generations and it's really empowering and exciting to see this next generation. I think it's gonna be much more robust uh, than perhaps we were, uh, not you in this room, but in general. Um, <laughs> we're leaving them a God awful mess, unfortunately. <laughs> And uh, I'm going to start out high level because there's plenty of people up here tonight that can really talk to you about Zenith in, in greater detail than I can. Uh, but I've been working on this river for 30 years and um, my organization, Portland Audubon Society, has been working on it for over 120. I recently came across from a quote from William Finley, who founded Portland Audubon in 1902. Uh, and around that time, he talked about the river and he said, it's, it's bad for fish, it's bad for people. So we've known uh, that this river has been a mess for a really long time. It's a uh, multi, 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 multi generational effort to restore it. You know, we've built our cities at the confluences of rivers uh, because they're good trade corridors. They're also biological hotspots. They're some of the most fertile areas, some of the most important areas ecologically. Uh, and, you know, you look at where great cities are, they tend to be at the confluences of rivers. And when we built them, we built them with complete uh, in consideration for nature. Uh, we, we, rather than building with nature, we simply pay, build, built over it. And when we talk about rivers, that meant uh, channelizing them, steepening them, hardening them, filling their floodplains, filling their wetlands, making them do what we needed them to do. Uh, and we've been paying a price ever since. Uh, and when you think about the confluence of the Columbia and the Willamette, uh, it's a it was an incredibly fertile floodplain. Most of what we are built upon was floodplain habitat, vast expanses of wetlands. Uh, it was a, a braided river um, that flowed all over the place. 
it was so shallow that you could walk across the river at Swan Island. You could walk to one from one side to the other. Uh, and when Lewis and Clark came through here, they talked about the fact they camped on what they called Image Canoe Island, that is uh, West Hayden Island or Hayden Island today. Uh, and they complained bitterly in their journals because uh, the birds kept them up all night. The migrating birds were so dense and they said it was simply horrid. Uh, so, uh, you know, the fish still come, the birds still come, and uh, it's not a question of whether they're going to come, it's whether they're going to find what they need when they get here. Every single salmon that uses the Willamette River system, and most that use the Columbia too, they tuck into the Willamette, uh, they are exposed to the most degraded, toxic river in the state for about 15 miles. Uh, they have to go through that. The birds that migrate through there don't find much either. Uh, and we wonder why we're in a biodiversity crisis. There are lots of reasons, but one of them is the way we've developed our landscape. So we need to think about building with nature and doing things differently. So I said I was going to start at a high level overview and let other folks talk about Zenith. Uh, I have worked on the river for 30 years and we have made progress. And it's because of rooms like this, people like you, that we have actually made advancements. Uh, we used our river as a cesspool, a place to put our, our pollution, a place to flush our toilets. Uh, again, uh, hardened, steepened, channelized, filled the floodplains. Um, we got the CSO project on the largest project in the history of Portland, $1.4 billion, our combined sewer overflow. So now we have relatively new, little sewage going into the river. Again, that's because people were willing to stand up and fight and fight year after year after year after year. Uh, we have a number of different problems on this river, whether it's ecological, human health, um, access, uh, equity issues. We know that these things affect people disproportionately. We know that uh, low income, uh, disenfranchised, marginalized communities, communities of color tend to suffer the worst. That's true on this river too. There's lots of data to dot back that up. Uh, what I want to convey tonight is that uh, there's a whole lot of different pathways that interconnect. They're complicated, they're overlapping, they're iterative, they're conflicting that we need to keep track of if we really want to get back to a healthy river. We need to fight projects like Zenith. We need to take on the bad projects when they come up. We need to get regulations in place to prevent them in the first place. But we need to stand up and fight things like Zenith. In some ways, that's an easy target because you know where they are, you know who they are, you know what they're doing, and it's a linear process to do it. It doesn't mean it's easy, but at least uh, you can see it. Uh, but there's also things like Portland Harbor Superfund. We're now in our 22nd year since the river was listed under Superfund. That's a law that delineates the most complicated, hazardous, uh, contaminated sites in the country. This is one of the biggest and most contaminated. Uh, we need to keep the pressure on that. We're moving into the, into the uh, cleanup stage, into the actual hitting the ground, cleaning up the contamination in the river. Uh, but all the companies that are working on that right now are coming up with plans for exactly what that's going to look like. Those will be rolling out in the next couple of years. We need to stay on top of those. Uh, we have something called the economic opportunities analysis. Who's heard of that? Because you were at the last meeting and you heard me talk about it. <laughs> you know, there is no funner issue to work on than the economic opportunities analysis. It's just, it just lights up rooms. It brings out people. Um, <laughs> And I won't bore you with a whole lot of detail about that tonight, but if you wonder why the river looks like it does and why it's as bad as it is, you need to think about the, er the economic opportunities analysis. And the quick version is, the thumbnail, is under statewide land use planning goal nine, the city has to maintain a 20 year supply of industrial land. The way they figure out whether they have a 20 year supply of industrial land is they do an economic opportunities analysis. Who pays attention to that? Nobody except for industry typically, right? And so they stock up the rooms, they do it behind closed doors, it's the antithesis of open public process. And basically every time they do it, they come up with a conclusion every five years that we have a deficit of river industrial land. It's a sleeper. Everyone's like, well, whatever, okay, that's, that's too bad, sorry. Well, what does that show up? City can't use that land for other, they have to focus on specifically finding new industrial land. And when it plays out in the regulatory arena, what happens? First, they uh, don't allow new environmental regulations. If you wonder why we don't have a tree code along the river, because of that. You wonder why the floodplain plan was just adopted or is it going through adoption doesn't focus on the river, Northreach? Because of that. You wonder why when we do environmental zone updates, we don't look there? Because of that. For the last decade, because industry has had a stranglehold on this, 
The same folks who are behind Zenith, the same folks who are stalling Superfund year after year after year, dominate this process, control it, and lead to the same conclusion. We don't actually have a deficit of industrial land. We actually have more industrial land along the river today than we had at any time in our history. We actually uh, have more throughputs than we've had historically. We have fewer jobs. Why do we have fewer jobs? Because they're putting them overseas, because they're automating for a whole lot of reasons, but basically it comes down to greed. And so we need to track things like that. Coming up, we have River Plan. River Plan is the vision going forward for the river. It's what do we want our river to be. Once they get done with the economic opportunities analysis, they're going to do a big planning process for the river, uh, for the North Reach. And that's basically our vision for what we want to be in 5, 10, 15, 20 years. We need to track that as well, uh, because that starts to lay the groundwork so we don't wind up with the zeniths of the future. And so my message to you tonight is, you know, please do stay involved keep fighting. Uh, I'm leaving Audubon after 30 years in um, 15 days. Uh, I'm not going far. I'll still be fighting beside you and with you on this issue. Um, but it takes sustained long term work. And we are making progress. Uh, my predecessor in this position, Mike Houck, was given $5,000 by the state back in the 1980s to basically walk the river and look for habitat. And the reason he was given $5,000 was for the state was because they said these urban riverways don't matter. We don't care about them. And so we would rather uh, just pay Audubon to do it for us. And so he walked the river and mapped all the habitat. But we were writing these places off even as little as 35 years ago. Uh, now we have rooms people, full of people fighting. We have the pollution, this, the sewage out. We have Superfund moving forward. We have activists fighting uh, oil trains and oil facilities. Uh, so keep fighting, and uh, again, it's been a pleasure fighting next to you for so long. Look forward to going forward. Thank you, Dara. Thank you so much. All right, so here's um, Melanie, and um, I just wanted to second that on Bob. The EOA is super important. So um, the more voices, the more people we have involved in that, um, the better. Um, it is uh, the future of the river. All right, Melanie. All right. Oh, there it is. Good. That's me. Um, next slide. So I'm going to talk about health and safety uh, at the hub. Um, I'm limited by the fact that there are 150 chemicals stored at the hub, and I only have seven minutes to talk. <laughs> so this is going to be a high-level overview. As you probably know, 90% of all the liquid fuel for the state of Oregon is stored in the hub, which as you'll hear is this incredibly seismically unstable zone, and 100% of our aviation fuel is stored at the hub. It's a, it's a, it's a toxic chemical cocktail that's there. Next slide. So if you go down there and you see trucks or um, trains that carry these placards, I want to do a little bit of decoding here for you and tell you what these placards mean. These are some of the most common placards that you'll see. 1267 stands for any kind of crude oil. Now, if it's crude oil that comes from the tar sands, it'll probably also have a white inhalation hazard um, placard because it has to be diluted. It's thick peanut butter and it has to be diluted to be put into the car. If it comes from the Bakken, it'll probably just have the 1267. The Bakken is the lighter oil, somewhat more explosive. 1203 is your friend gasoline. And 1202, well, you'll, if you've spent any time down in the hub, you see truck after truck after truck leaving to go to the gas stations all over the state. 1202 is diesel, and that would be either renewable diesel or fossil diesel. And then there's one other I don't have up there, which is 3257 is asphalt. And that's one that you'll probably smell a lot if you're down there because it's a very stinky um, substance. Next slide. Oh, next slide. <laughs> okay, so when I was thinking about this talk, there's really three ways we can get exposed to um, hazardous substances from the hub. One is during the routine operation of the hub, and that would include things like the diesel engines that bring the trains in or uh, that uh, the trucks are doing, and also the routine 
um, operation of um, leak it, leaks during normal operation. And then the second category would be accidental releases, like when the big one hits, or there's a huge spill, or a fire, or an explosion. And then the third one, which I'm going to get to later, and I think it's sometimes overlooked, but the health hazard from the usage of the fuels in the hub is huge. Next slide. So these are some of the pollutants that we're talking about. Criteria pollutants, what that means is these are the things that are regulated under the Clean Air Act. So these are sometimes measured and there are rules. Now, just uh, next slide, I think there's a subtitle here. Can you just click on it and see? Yeah, oops, go back. Meets regulations doesn't mean that it's healthy for you. So if somebody says Zenith hasn't exceeded the amount of NOx that they're um, putting out, it doesn't mean that that's a healthy level. In this country, we tend to have levels that are set pretty high for being allowable because they're balanced with economic factors. Whereas in Canada or the European Union, other places usually have lower levels. And then there's the whole category of, it's basically everything else, all those other 150 things, the toxics, the VOCs, the volatile things are the ones that you smell. And then many of the others like PCBs, um, the heavy metals, some of those are solids and they can easily get into the groundwater, they can get into the animals, they can get into us. And some of these are forever chemicals, they never go away. Next slide. So the health risks from these emissions, basically they affect people of all ages and they affect every body system. Um, in the reproductive years, they cause things like premature birth, low birth weight, possibly in utero exposure might lead to things like autism and ADHD. We don't know the answers to a lot of these. Um, many kinds of cancer are attributable to some of these substances. And then of course, not good for our lungs and our heart, they can cause us to die early. One area that I think is getting more attention in the last decade, we're kind of at a point with the, the neurological effect of some of these um, substances where we were with cancer maybe 50 years ago. So it's just really coming into um, more common um, knowledge. They cause things like depression and dementia. So not good for our brains either. Next slide. So if you had to choose a place to put all these terrible chemicals and store the fossil fuels, there's probably no worse place than where they are because we have an intersection of all of these factors. It's unstable soil at risk for seismic events. It's close to a river. It's also close to the urban core. It's adjacent to Forest Park, which in a drought could easily catch on fire. Most of the storage tanks were built before the risks were understood. And the number of, of people who would be affected if there was a catastrophic event, which there will be, depending on how you look at it, there's about 200 people who actually work in the CEI hub, but there's over 30,000 who live or work somewhere close to it. And some of these events that you can imagine would affect many of those people. And of course, everybody in Oregon would be affected in the situation where the big one hits because we wouldn't have ready access to the fuels that are stored there. Next slide. Oh, this is to remind me to talk about how fires could be started. So the tanks, if you took a cross section through them or you did some kind of MRI or whatever, <laughs> um, they have these floating lids. And when the big one hits, the lid, as you can imagine, would uh, have some friction to the wall of the tank and could cause sparks, which could easily cause a fire. And the fire is more likely due to our hotter summers and our drought now. Um, next slide. So how did, how did the hub come to be where it was? Well, it has a bit of a story. Um, this is David Campbell, and he was the fire chief in Portland back in 1911. And there was uh, an oil storage facility near Southeast Salmon and Water Streets where some of you live in that area, work in that area. And he was killed in the explosion. And so they decided to move the tanks to Linton. And Linton soon afterwards was annexed to be part of Portland. 
Next slide. Okay, I can't get by without talking about Northwest Natural, my favorite company, not. Um, the blue dot there is liquefied natural gas. That's natural gas that has been chilled from its gaseous form into a liquid form. So it's cooled and basically it's under pressure in that tank. As you can see, it's, it's really close to the St. John's Bridge. And some people have called it the bomb under the bridge. Um, next slide. This is what's called the cold box. It was built 54 years ago. It needs to be upgraded. And Northwest Natural is going to try to get 10 to $15 million um, out of their customers in order to upgrade this. Next slide. There we go. So the yellow area here, this is the map of Portland and Northwest Natural's um, service territory. The yellow area is the area that is served by that blue tank. And it's only used, that liquefied natural gas is only used during the winter peak heating season, okay? So they don't even need it most of the time. It's about 13% of Northwest Natural's customers that rely on it. Maybe you live in that area. Here's my dream. My dream is everybody in, who lives in the yellow area gets a first crack at the funds for electrification of their home. So we no longer <laughs> need to have that tank there. Next slide. So when we burn the fuel, we get all these things, particulate matter, carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, I only have one more minute, so I'm gonna start talking faster. Next slide. Particulate matter, really bad stuff. It's so tiny that not only do you breathe it in and it goes to your lungs, into your bloodstream, it also gets into your brain. And as it goes, it carries any toxics that are carried on the particles. Next slide. Nitrogen dioxide increases, you've probably heard, childhood asthma, all-cause mortality, lung and breast cancer, pregnancy problems, lung conditions. Next slide, this is a subtitle here. Air pollution has been associated, whoops, can you go back? Uh, has been associated with an increase in Alzheimer's disease, teenage depression, and bad calls by umpires. <laughs> so it's really bad for your brain. Next slide. Uh, this is a quick thing about renewable be diesel. Basically, it's really not any better than fossil diesel in terms of when it spills, flammable, um, and whether or not it creates less air pollution, it depends on what kind of engine you're talking about. Next slide. So this is, as I mentioned, kind of hot off the presses. Scientists are finding increased evidence, not only for neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, um, ALS, but also for the neurodevelopmental problems, autism, ADHD, depression. So the burning of the fuel that's in the hub causes a lot of these issues. Next slide. But we can get better if we make the air better. Next slide. <laughs> so I like um, calling the era where we burned everything, as Stephen Klein has coined it, the Pyrocene. Okay, we've gotten by for almost two hundred thousand years with burning everything, but the problem is everything we burn, we breathe. We need to stop burning things. Next slide. So getting off the fossil fuels, it's not a sacrifice. It'll make our health better, it'll make our climate better, and it'll make our city safer. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. Okay, so I think we have uh, Jay is coming up here next. And, you know, and just um, to piggyback on um, Melanie here, we just had a spill in North Portland through Cathedral Park this weekend. Um, so EPA is going to be getting in touch. Oh, we just had a spill in Cathedral Park um, this weekend. Uh, EPA will be getting in touch with um, Portland Harbor Community Advisory Group to let us know how, how bad that was. But supposedly the spill went through Cathedral Park on the tracks. So it's just a matter of time. These things do happen. So, you know, we just really need to work hard and let our 
let folks in City Hall know that we got to change. Um, it was it was diesel fuel. Yeah, diesel. That's what we think. We don't know how heavy it is or what type it is, but um, we'll be finding out soon. Okay, thank you. Good evening. Uh, looking to see if uh, if my slides uh, can be brought up. Thank you. Um, next slide. <laughs> Uh, thanks so much. I'm so glad to be here to talk about the CEI Hub. Uh, I've just boiled mine down to five key takeaway issues I wanted all of you to consider and uh, to internalize uh, as we go forward and we all collectively become aware of what the issues are and the opportunities that are tied to those issues. Um, so first and foremost, number one, the earthquake. Next slide. <laughs> uh, I've got this one map. This is from a 2018 study that the Department of Geology and Mineral Industries produced for the, the metro area counties, but it's showing the perceived uh, shaking and damage potential. So it's kind of got a combination of what's coming up here. But basically, and it's hidden behind the, the, the people who are on their cameras here, but from green down all the way to red, the red is, is a really bad, it's, it's severe shaking. And so not unexpectedly, the riverine areas, basically where the airport is, but on the Willamette, the North Willamette, this area in that, that oblong circle is the six miles of the CEI hub. And um, it's uh, on soil that will uh, not only liquefy, which is where it fails to hold up any weight uh, and bearing strength, but it also amplifies. And so that means it actually will shake multiple times more than this orange and yellow uh, soil, uh, which are either the mountains there or some of the higher ground. So it, it will shake harder and fail. And on both of those, uh, plus four to five minutes of shaking. Uh, the, so what I'm trying to to drill in is that one, the earthquake is, is definitely going to happen. It may or may not happen in our lifetimes, but the more time that goes by, the more likely it will happen in our children's lifetimes and even more likely in our grandchildren's lifetimes. Uh, we're fast approaching uh, January 26th, which will be the 323rd anniversary of the last magnitude nine earthquake. So we're, we're 329 years into what is somewhere between a three to 700 year average for these events to happen. And uh, I don't really go for the probabilities that a lot of the earthquake scientists use. Uh, Dr. Chris Goldfinger has kind of turned it around and said, yes, 10%, 15%, 20% chance in 50 years. But he said of the 40 plus earthquakes that have happened in 10,000 years, 19 of those are magnitude nines. By 323 years, 75% of them would have already happened. And to me, that's a much more telling figure to remember, that we're already into what would have been 75% of the historical record. And in another, I think, by the time we get to 2050, it'll be closer to 80%. Uh -huh. Next slide. So this is, slide one was the earthquake. Slide two are the tanks. Um, there's, th these are from some statistics that I had put together before the city of Portland and Multnomah County's report was released by Eco Northwest, but they're, they're still pretty close. Um, I think it's now about 400 plus uh, tanks, um, a, a little about 300 or more are actively in use every day. But the problem is most of them were built prior to having any earthquake codes in, uh, in Oregon. I think I uh, had read just recently that the average age of all of these tanks that they can find the ages for is that they were built in 1954. That's the average age for hundreds of tanks. This uh, bottom here says that numerous in-service large tanks were built prior to 1930. The majority of the fuel capacity built prior to 1970. We didn't have a state earthquake code until 1975. Uh, we don't have even close to codes that we should have for the, the magnitude 9 earthquake until the early 90s. Um, and in fact, we still don't have codes currently, and I'm 
saying this with as much as I fully understand, like the kind of codes they have in places like Japan or in Chile, which have experienced these kinds of earthquakes. So we, we really need to think strong and hard about what we're doing when we're building forward uh, in this area. Next slide. Next is the spill. Uh, we've got a lot of tanks that are going to fail in that earthquake. Um, I did the math for 300,000, uh, 300 million gallons. If we only uh, lost 3% of that volume, it would equal the Exxon Valdez event. And do you think we're only going to lose 3%? The study had said that it could be t many times over that. I think between 20 and 40%. Not all of it will go into the river, but even 3% going into the river is equal to what was the worst oil spill in US history at that time, 30 years ago. Um, what I've also found in my research in talking to the local EPA office, talking to DEQ, Department of Environmental Quality, just a couple of weeks ago to the regional uh, spill response coordinator is, is no, we don't have a strategy or a contingency for multiple facility failures following an earthquake. Most of the plans, most of the training, most of the drills that are done with the fire marshal's office and local hazmat teams are for a pipe break or maybe a small leak or a spill uh, from a train, which are all can be significant. But when, when I've done consulting up the food chain for the regional federal spill response capacity that we have in the Pacific Northwest, this isn't on their uh, index. There's no, they're, they're not even haven't yet considered a contingency for this. And they just updated their regional plan one year ago. I was referencing the 2019 or 2015 plan when I put these slides together. And so what, um, what I'm really asking for going forward is we need an acknowledgement of that. We need, to, we need to have that acknowledged by the state, by the federal government, because otherwise a lot of people assume this is going to be handled when it when something bad happens and that's on a blue sky day this is after the biggest earthquake this country's ever faced next slide and so where are we right now right now we're in the middle of this period with this rules advisory committee from the department of environmental qualities senate bill 1567. thank you senator dembro and the other elected officials <laughs> city and county who worked so hard to get this bill passed uh, and there's a lot of information here and there are a number of people who are actively involved in this rule advisory committee um, i pulled out this quick section here to say rules adopted under this section shall include but not be limited to and this is section three number two and then under line e that uh, design and construction standards for new bulk storage tanks and also design and construction standards for seismic mitigation, which is retrofitting of existing bulk storage tanks. But the question for me is, can this also mean removal and relocation? It's not directly mentioned. I haven't got an answer yet from the folks who are running this process for DEQ, but I'd like to think that this statement gives a lot more opportunity for going even further for either outright removal, decommissioning, or relocation uh, as an option to only retrofitting or replacement. Um, but th the point of this question is, if, if there's no fail safe for, for managing the spill that we know is gonna happen, then the imperative for us getting it right with this rules committee for saying, we're, if you're gonna retrofit these, you're gonna retrofit them so there is no failure, so we can continue to use them, and that's really expensive or you're gonna to have to build brand new ones that are state of the science and even better, that are gonna to continue to function afterwards, uh, or you're gonna remove them or move them. But this is the only thing we have between us and the spill happening someday, or the standards we're about to put in place and the, and the participation and willingness uh, of the oil companies in having this put upon them. Last slide. And so this is my biggest takeaway with one minute left. We need a comprehensive and aligned policy vision. We've been told uh, by the rules committee managers that uh, talking about seismic policy and tying climate, seismic, climate policy with seismic policy and environmental policy is way outside of the scope of what this group is doing. And so therefore, 
we, we need to find a way to, to weave this thread so that the CEI hub is a part of our 2035 and 2050 visioning for greenhouse gas reductions. If we're drawing down our need, then we can also draw down the need to store all of this and therefore limit uh, the amount of exposure and vulnerability we have for creating the biggest oil spill in US history. Um, one other main thing, I've, I've spoken with the Oregon Global Warning uh, Commission about their long-term plans. This was during public comment back in September, brought this up to them <clears throat> and they said very politely, that's an interesting point, but that's outside of our scope. And I said, how can the 90% the of the oil storage for the entire state be outside of the scope of what you're planning for 30 years from now? And, uh, and so this brings me down, you know, basically in the time I have to the very bottom line is we really have to find a way to align our, our concepts and values around resilience, around sustainability and the environment. And ultimately it's a little bit obscured, but the, the three areas we need ownership. We need the people who have the responsibility for this to step up. And all of us actually have a piece of this that we have ownership because we live here. Uh, the other side is stewardship, and we see that represented here tonight as well. We need to fold all of the environmental stewardship that's been taking place for so long into the decision making process. And then the last one is leadership, which is what we don't have at the overarching level of leading a path forward at a policy level that puts us towards the 2050 goals. That still isn't here. And if we're doing all of these decisions now that are going to create the future for our kids and our grandkids. We need a policy vision that's looking through the earthquake towards going forward and is helping to set the bar for what we're actually doing with these legal processes we're all in. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, you, Dave. thank you very much, sir. Okay, and I think we have, I think Barbara's up coming up. If it's Barbara. We actually have 10. Okay. And, not, okay. and um, I, I know everyone's probably, I hope everyone's okay after this one. No one's not too afraid, but I just wanted to let folks know too that we do do tours. Um, Sarah Taylor with the Brady River Campaign does do some walking tours in North Portland. It's a totally different thing seeing something like this on a screen than actually being there and walking the ground. So I would encourage um, you to, you know, visit Sarah, go back and find out when her next tour is. I believe she has one coming up maybe this weekend. Um, it's, it's a really big difference being on the ground and walking that area. Um, all right, Barbara. So we're going to start out with uh, the first. How about now? Is it on? Okay. Yes? Okay. We're going to start by looking at the first five minutes of a documentary slideshow that I just finished like yesterday um, that goes along with a radio documentary that aired on cable in October and then again a couple weeks ago called, okay. How about this one? Is this one better? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So we're going to start with the first five minutes of this slideshow documentary that I um, produced, finished it a couple days ago, and it goes along with a radio documentary that I aired in Kibu a couple months ago. And so we'll just start by watching this and then I can talk after that. One. I lived for a while in a ramshackle neighborhood in Southeast Portland, less than half a mile from the Willamette River. But there was no way to get to the river. Across the river was downtown Portland, where a freeway and a seawall also blocked river access. When I would drive north along the river from my house, I was most puzzled by a road sign in North Portland for Swan Island, and another one across the river in Northwest Portland for Giles Lake, because there was no evidence of either an island or a lake. I later learned that many years before, the main river channel along Swan Island's east side was filled with spoils from dredging the west channel to make that shallow, narrow stretch of river a navigation channel. Some of that dredging debris was also used to fill Giles Lake, which eventually became an industrial site. 
the Willamette River was once this braided channel. It was very shallow and it had a huge floodplain that is now developed and covered with buildings and streets and industry. If you look at the river long enough, you can see that it has its own story to tell. You can let yourself imagine how the river was a braided river. There were areas that you could actually walk through to get to the other side. There's different bars and islands and lakes and wetlands. It's kind of this magical landscape. And it was like that for thousands of years. You're listening to Once a Braided River, a tale of how Portland abused and degraded the river that runs through it. Right where we're sitting, you can almost imagine what this place must have looked like with this amazingly beautiful forest. We're sitting with Travis Williams, executive director of Willamette Riverkeeper, along the industrialized north reach of the Willamette River, just a few miles from its confluence with the Columbia River. Floodplain, wetland areas, tidal flats, all on the west side of the river here, and a big dugout canoe, perhaps traveling up to what we now call Oregon City at Willamette Falls there meeting peoples that shared this area with them, Clackamas or Kalapuyan at the falls and Chinook and other peoples further down river here. Where we're sitting right now actually is the Chinook village site. We're in Cathedral Park under the St. John's Bridge in North Portland with Elijah Cetus, a member of Portland's Sunrise Movement and a founding member of the Braided River Campaign. Across the river, those are a series of lakes and they were a really important food gathering place this would have been a biodiversity hotspot, and the amount of wildlife here historically was phenomenal. Bob Salinger is the conservation director for Portland Audubon. When Lewis and Clark came through here, they camped on what we now call West Hayden Island, and they talked about the noise from the waterfowl being so loud that they couldn't sleep at night. But it speaks to the fact that there was incredible amounts of wildlife here, and that for a lot of wildlife, they still have to pass through. This is a migratory corridor for birds. The fish have no other choice but to come through Portland Harbor on their life cycle. People came out this way to make fortunes in the 19th century. Michael Pouncil is a member of the Portland Harbor Community Advisory Group and the Braided River Campaign. Folks from the Northeast, Boston men is what a lot of the Native Americans called them, came here to seek their dream. It's kind of unfortunate that they didn't really value what was already here, almost like they had coins on their eyes and were just blind to the riches that were already here. There were three lakes on the west side. There was Giles Lake, which was like around 350 acres, Kittredge and Doan Lake. Sarah Taylor is a midwife, retired educator, and a founder of the Brady River Campaign by dredging the river and filling the lakes, filling the land so that there is no more island. We've really tried to redraw the Lower Willamette River so that it is not braided. We tried to take every braid out of it. These river confluence areas are incredibly important areas uh, for biodiversity. They're also the places that we have chosen typically to develop cities because they created great transportation corridors. And so what we've done to our river over the last century, century and a half, is deepened it, channelized it, steepened and hardened its banks, and removed all its vegetation, filled its floodplains, and developed right up to its edge. Totally changing the river has cost Portland a lot of money. You still pay through federal taxes for ongoing dredging. You're paying for the Superfund cleanup. You're paying for all these things to keep that system of the braided river at bay. If they stop dredging, it will go back. Today, Lamb River, Columbia River, the urban stretches are in terrible shape. They're also highly polluted. Decades of industrial pollution has created a situation where the last 10 miles of the Lamb River are a federal Superfund site. A Superfund site means that it's part of this federal program that identifies the most toxic sites across the country. Cassie Cohen is the executive director of Portland Harbor Community Coalition. Yeah. We, can, we can stop the film stop, now. Stop it, uh, stop it, please. Okay, thank you. Okay. Well, if you want to see the whole thing, you can just watch it now. Um, it's on my website, onceabratedriver.org. It's a 53-minute documentary, uh, basically the same form as this. And one of the things that I 
realized as I was working on this piece was that I've had a fascination for many, many years of trying to imagine what the landscape was before we really screwed it up. And so I was thinking back with all these times I did it. And I thought, well, I started when I was a hippie in Portland in the 70s, and I'd hang around on Hawthorne Boulevard and try to imagine that we got any cars. Little did I know that it was before there were cars, there was a river that ran down Hawthorne Boulevard called Brooklyn Creek. Mm -hmm. And that, in fact, there's hundreds of miles of culverted creeks under Portland. And that the west side, the east side of Portland was all wetland, where um, the east side industrial area is, was in a, it was kind of like West Titan Island. It would keep you up at night because it was the bridge, the waterfowl was so loud. And I've spent time like on top of the Bonneville Dam imagining the cascade still there and at Salilo, trying to imagine Salilo Falls when I stand by the Dallas Dam. Uh, I've learned an awful lot more in doing this project about what was in the North <coughs> River of the Willamette River, which is really heartbreaking. But I think that what we really need to do is to be able to imagine what it used to be before it was completely screwed up and that that will give us the power and the commitment to start to really work to reclaim what we've lost. That's my first point. Um, the other thing that kind of came to me in working on this was braiding all these issues together. And I just want to read a quote, and this will be my, my last statement. This is a quote from Elijah Cetus, who you saw very briefly as we were hanging out under the St. John's Bridge. And Elijah said, that as they were trying to decide, the group, the Braided River Campaign was trying to decide on a name. And somebody came up with saying, I've always loved the thought that the Willamette River used to be braided. And so Elijah said that the, um, the image of a braided river helped us to understand what we're trying to do together. It speaks to the past, to what the river was and could still be, and the way it wants to flow in its channel. And it also speaks to the present, to the fact that we're still braided together, that Linton is connected to St. John's and the rest of Portland, and to the Superfund site, and to the history and the fossil fuel economy, and to the birds that fly down the Pacific Flyway. Our goal is to weave together these intersectional and distinct issues that we hear our communities talk about and that we think about that isn't represented in the way that the industrial hub is planned. And so our work is to braid all these things together and braid ourselves together from all the different communities that we come from, all the different interests and backgrounds that we come from and fight for that EOA. <laughs> That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Barbara. And um, our next guest is Josie. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 that's right. Um, right now, let's take like maybe um, two, three minutes and um, say hello to your neighbor next door and talk about what's hey. going what you what you've learned tonight uh you know check out the bathroom if you like if you need to and, and then we're going to come back here promptly in about three minutes okay <laughs> Thank you. 
Hello? Okay, we're going to ask that folks slowly bring yourselves back to your chairs, please. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks, y'all. If you could come back to your seats, we're going to just wrap up real quick, and then we can all have a longer time to catch up together. Awesome. We'll just wait another minute while folks find their seats so we can wrap up. Awesome, thanks you all so much. Um, yeah, my name's Josie, I work with the Breach Collective and I'm gonna just kind of bring us home here with the issue of the hour, which is Zenith. Um, next slide. So I'm gonna basically be um, summarizing where we're at, where we've been the last um, few weeks. We've been fighting super hard to get the um, Lux permit that um, Portland City Council gave to Zenith rescinded. So I'm going to catch everyone up with where we are with that. Next slide. Awesome. So the first thing is that we've been extremely vocal as a community. So again, shout out to all the organizations who are doing such good work. On the left is a letter that we submitted to City Council. Um, essentially demanding some kind of public process with the Zenith land use comp compatibility statement application. Um, the city had approved their Lux application without um, ha having any kind of public involvement and the community was clearly really outraged by that in addition to us wanting them to rescind the Lux anyways because it's just um, clear that Zenith's uh, operations at the CEI hub facility involving the transport of crude oil um, are dangerous for the public. So we submitted this coalition letter and then what we got in response was um, what is on the right hand side, which was a letter from the um, City Bureau of Developmental Services. And um, they're the prong of the city government that's responsible for issuing the Lux. So great that they got back to us. Um, really would have loved probably a bit more um, substantive um, communication with them essentially what they had uh, written back to the coalition was that the city of portland has its hands tied and if we want to challenge zenith we should do so at the state level at the oregon department of environmental quality there's a few <laughs> reasons why that's a frustrating response to have gotten from the city um, a lot of the stuff we've heard tonight for example uh, 90 percent of Oregon's fuels being stored <laughs> on our riverfront. I don't know if we can really trust the state level to be advocating for Portland residents like we should be able to expect our city government to. So that was a pretty frustrating response. Um, next slide. Um, this is especially true uh, because the city council isn't going to have unlimited power to rescind the Lux forever once um, Zenith applies with that Lux to the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality to get their state level permitting, then we're kind of screwed. <laughs> We've like given our one chance to um, limit Zenith, which is the Lux away. So um, under Oregon administrative rules, city council until DEQ uses that Lux to issue them that state level permit can withdraw the Lux that they issued. Next slide. And Zenith knows that too. So this is a um, screenshot of their application to the DEQ um, ACDB permit. And you can see at the bottom there, Zenith is eager to have this permit issued expeditiously. Um, they know that once DEQ issues them the state level permit, we're gonna be um, fighting a much steeper battle here um, to try to get their facility shut down. Next slide. Um, yeah, and so just to reiterate the legal standing that we um, are arguing that um, Zenith or City Council could deny Zenith's Lux if they wanted to, <laughs> um, as long as they can provide the reasoning that Zenith um, and their activities at the CEI hub facility is in compliance or like not out of 
sync with the city's comprehensive land use plan. Um, if they can make that argument, they can deny the Lux. Next slide. And here's what the city um, comprehensive land use plan says. So there's all sorts of different prongs, um, provisions that arguably you could, you could make the argument at least if city council wanted to, that um, Zenith's operations are in or out of sync with this plan. There's you know, climate arguments that you can make, there's um, freight system stability arguments you could make. You've heard a bunch of arguments tonight um, but the city thus far has chosen not to do that. Next slide. So yeah, here comes the call to action. Um, city Council is really just kind of digging their heels, trying to wait until it's too late. Um, but we are not going anywhere until Zenith does, and we need to make sure that they know that. So reaching out to your City Council members, whether that's calling them, emailing them, writing them gorgeous letters, putting art in those letters, you know, whatever you can do, maybe with friends, um, that would be really great. We want to make sure that we're keeping the pressure on. Um, and then finally, I'll also say, oh, it's, <laughs> it's hidden. <laughs> but um, I know that members with the Scrub the, Hub, Scrub the Hub Coalition are also going to be working with folks to try to get um, neighborhood associations to submit letters as well. And as much as we would hope our commissioners respond to individual residents complaining, I think neighborhood associations hold a lot of sway. So um, if you want to reach out to Scrub the Hub Coalition, I know Bonnie, um, and you could also reach out to me, um, are going to be trying to coordinate folks to do that. Um, and I think that that's where I'm going to leave it tonight. We're, we're going to have a um, questions session afterwards, and also folks are welcome to come up to me afterwards and ask more questions. Um, but I think that's where we're at. So spread the word. Don't let city council off the hook. Um, Zenith is just one prong of the many, many issues with the CEI hub, but it's the one that's, you know, relevant right now. So thanks. Okay. All right. So, um, yeah, um, I'm going to ask our panelists a couple of questions and then afterwards um, folks can come up and talk to them individually, but um, we have just a couple of general questions that we're going to ask of everyone here. So um, what are the most effective ways to share info on the CEI hub and Zenith Energy with the general public? <laughs> well, actually, the documentary that I made is for that purpose. The documentary that I made is for that purpose. And so anybody who wants to know how to get it and show it, come up to me afterwards. But I feel like uh, I was able to string together all the issues, starting with what the river was like through the Superfund and winding up with uh, into Zenith. That was kind of a climax. And then we wound up with the EOA. <laughs> So, and I think, I think I made it kind of accessible, hopefully, with a lot of help from Bob Salinger. So, and then actually the last part was visioning of what we want the river to be. So I think that that's a really important piece to hold on to while we're trying to make a big point about making the CEI hub basically go away, because I don't think there's any way to make it safe and use that as a time to rethink our dependence on fossil fuel, and then to really spend some time thinking about what we really want the river to be. Anyone else want to shoot at that question? Um, I've been involved in working on this since uh, I was with the Oregon Seismic Safety Policy Advisory Commission um, over 10 years ago uh, when we developed the Oregon Resilience Plan. And the CEI Hub was one of our number one uh, issues that we were putting forward. Uh, it was considered the Achilles heel of the state because of the 90% of the volume there. But um, the, at that time, the reports were only looking at uh, the loss of, of the fuel supply after the earthquake. That was the criticality. Um, and uh, it wasn't really until um, I would say 2019 and in that time frame where a lot of the community meetings that were going on and some of the work I was doing asking all these questions started focusing on the environmental impact of all the, the failure, the multi-facility cascading failures and the scale and scope of the environmental disaster. To me, 
it, it eclipses so much of, of a lot of the other concerns that were historically of importance. And so I've, I've started saying it's not an Achilles heel, it's a Pandora's box. Yeah. And um, the, the fact that it really, the, 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 those types of, of uh, I mean, the metaphors, I think help people appreciate the scale and scope, but I think um, emphasizing the fact that this thing uh, is just waiting to go and it's, it's an event that we can't allow to happen and we can control this. We, have, we can't stop the earthquake but we can stop this from becoming the worst oil spill in US history. Uh, and so part of it is the imperative for all of us to speak up, to ask hard questions, to voice our concerns and our just frankly, not allowing this to remain uh, something that will be handled by somebody someday. Um, and so I just say word of mouth, uh, you know, any way that's possible to get people engaged. The only other thing I'll quickly add, and I was asked to mention this, was the state resilience officer that you, that's in the governor's office. It was our number one uh, recommendation for the very first biennium uh, in the legislature in 2014-15. We got the position created by the governor's office, and then that position went away, or I should say the person occupying the position left with Governor Brown's office. We just heard at the end of last week that that position has been filled, but it's been blended with the wildfire program director. And so the person who was tasked with being the, the, the tip of the spear for seismic resilience and, and to help to weave a lot of these policies together down at the state capitol is now being kind of subsumed with all of the issues going on with wildfire. And uh, there's a number of us who are having just learned this in, the, in less than a week ago, really chiming into the governor's office that we need that issue to have its own, you know, standing for so people to ask those questions for the, that person to be able to have that level of, of access and power and authority on, on something as big as this, that it can't be something that's coupled and bundled and potentially doesn't get the attention that it deserves. I was going to say that there's nothing like seeing the hub up close to really change your mind and, and change your life. And I'm serious about that. So if any of you haven't been to the hub or you have a neighborhood group or a bunch of family or friends, you can talk to Sarah, who's sitting underneath the black sign back there, or you can talk to me. I love doing tours um, of the hub. So um, I think going down there is really important. What's Sarah's last name? Taylor. Taylor. He's just sitting right back there at that table. <laughs> so we're going to jump to our second question here. So what is the range of possible solutions to the dangers that are presented to the community and environment by the CEI hub seismic liquefaction threats? I'll, I'll go first because my answer is not going to be a real answer, um, but it's it's kind of whatever you want it to be. I mean, like there are so many different frameworks that exist in the law. There's so many different administrative agencies that exist who have some connection to one of the arguments we've made here tonight. Um, it's really more about envisioning as a community what we want there and then figuring out legally how to make that argument. Um, so I think the place to start is is really like digging down, um, getting roots in this fight. And this kind of goes back to the last question, but anything that you can do that also simultaneously builds community, builds creativity, um, builds art, those kinds of things are gonna be really um, where we need to begin. Yeah, I'll just echo that. It was my closing slide. We need a vision. We need a comprehensive overarching policy vision uh, that ties the the risk of the facility with climate adaptation and drawing down the earthquake risk can actually leverage where we want to be with climate change. It's, it's one of the few positive feedback loops that we can actually have right now uh, to, to say we're going to draw this down and leverage something else that we actually want, which is to get to green energy. They work together, but they have to be bundled. They have to be articulated and we have to have the champions to bring this to the front and center. Otherwise, we're working with all these stovepipes and as well-intentioned as a lot of people are, they're still very energy focused uh, and the climate folks aren't talking with the seismic folks and a lot of the environmental folks aren't uh, thinking about the earthquake and what it could do. And so I think the vision is number one, but otherwise 
we've got this rules committee that's working on this right now and they need to have a much broader palette of what they're working with. Commissioner Myron. Yeah, I'm in <laughs> I am so impressed that that, wow. Um, Sharon Myron, one of the, I'm Multnomah County Commissioner for District 1, which is this district. And this I have in all your work has, have made it onto my radar um, a while back. Thank you. And um, I just wanted to add, as we're, as we're doing this advocacy work, as we're thinking about who to contact, how to elevate this issue, how to bring these groups together, the human health component of this is so important. I'm just, I happen to be sitting right here about by the sign with every body system, every age group is potentially affected by emissions at the CEI hub cause problems in, in so many areas. I am a doctor, so you know this is near and dear to my heart. Multnomah County is the board of health. We can use that as yet another way to get at this at the this issue. So don't just write to your city commissioners, write to all of us, show up, testify as so many of you have done. And um, we need to bring it together and include human health as part of the reason that we need to take urgent action. So thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, all right. And so now onto our last and final question. Um, will CEI Hub tank farm operators and owners dodge the Oregon legislators requirements and Senate Bill 1567, March of 2022, for submitting accurate seismic um, vulnerability assessments by June 2024. Are you confident that DEQ will enforce the requirement? Do you view this as an <laughs> adequate fix? <laughs> <laughs> your real house, Jay. <laughs> well, I, I, I think DEQ has rolled their sleeves up, and they're working earnestly on the process that they're in right now. And uh, you know, they're creating a new program. I think um, the question I have, and I'm not uh, a, a legal person, is you know, where does their authority begin and end uh, in terms of having regulation? And um, I think that's what's going to put this to the test is how do the oil companies weave and navigate through um, the shoulds and the shalls in terms of how the law requires them to self-assess their vulnerability and uh, to, to tr take what's being presented as a plan rather than you know, maybe something more than a plan, which is a regulation uh, that's stronger. It's one of the reasons, talking about engagement, I mean, I, I, I really think we also need our federal delegation involved in this. Mm. This is not just a, an Oregon issue, it's also on the river, it's a Washington issue. And it's a, a Pacific Northwest economic issue. There's $21 billion a year that's in traffic on, on the river too. And so there's so much at stake. Uh, it's hard for us to imagine that those of us who are working in the city and the county, and even at the state level, can tackle these multinational companies and requiring them to do something they've never in the history of this entire time wanted to do. So I'm, I, it, I guess I'm, it's the trust but verify, but I'm, 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 I'm kind of skeptically optimistic. <laughs> First of all, I worry about what's gonna happen between now and 2024. And I actually mentioned that to Mike Dembro a couple of times. I, so I guess we just have to cross our fingers the earthquake doesn't happen before they get a plan in place. Uh, but the other thing that I'm thinking about is the, the long time it took, but the success that the fight against Jordan Cove had in getting elected officials on board. And it took a while. Uh, at first it was just like what, Golden, what, what's his name? Yeah, Jeff Golden and uh, Pam Marsh, and then a few others came along, and then Ron Wyden and, Bill, and uh, Peter DeFazio and Jeff Merkley. 
And so we're seeing some of that same action happen in stopping the GTN, GTN Express extension pipeline that they're trying to force through us right now. And there's been the attorney generals have come of Oregon, Washington, and California all come out against it. There's pressure to put the make the governors come out against it. So I think again, I mean the GTN Express pipeline is pretty scary, but I think the CEI hub dwarfs just about anything I'm scared of in the Northwest or right. in the world for that matter. And so I think we really should be putting pressure on every elected official to come out and take the stand. And uh, I, if we need um, some lessons on how to do it, just talk to um, Rogue Climate down in uh, yeah. Phoenix, yeah. Oregon, and uh, get some pointers <laughs> because they really know how to organize. <laughs> Yeah, Barbara alluded to it, but I would put pressure on Tina Kotek. We have a new governor. Yes. And she lives in Portland. She knows this issue. She needs it. She needs an environmental agenda. It's not one of the three big things she's put as her priority, uh, but the environment and particularly climate change needs to be a priority for the state. It needs to be a top tier priority. And, uh, you know, we've been in this movie before, unfortunately, uh, where we had a situation where the Port of Portland wanted to put contaminated waste on West Hayden Island in their dredge deposit area. The city of Portland went back and forth on the Lux. They finally issued it. DEQ let us down. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers let us down. EPA let us down. It was a shell game of who, who could do what. Oh, we can only do this because of that, but we can only do it if they do th this thing. And it went through. And I, I think the state is the pivotal player here to some degree, because if the state starts to stand up, if the governor stands up and says, this is a priority, this is unacceptable, we're not going to go there, I want the state agencies to work to get this, that is a trickle up effect to the federal government, right? If traditional delegation is not going against the governor for the most part, especially a democratic delegation is not going to go against the democratic governor. Uh, the agencies are not going to go against the governor. So I see the governor as sort of the, the connective piece to this. That's where I put my pressure. Well, whatever else. Well, um, that I think that does it for my questions tonight. So um, once again, visit the tabling back there. Um, uh, uh, speak amongst each other. Oh, oh, one more thing. So sorry. Um, grab your gravel. Remember that. And we have the power, so um, come up, take some pictures of that, or write it down for Wednesday, February 8th. And there's some flyers as well. So um, let's, uh, let's band together and smash something. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.